thought, I just want to thank Latam and I want to thank Jens and Miriam for um, having me here. When I talked with both of them and I asked them, what do you want me to talk about? And I said, well, you had three interesting books to talk about all of them in 15 minutes. So I will try, but I don't promise I can succeed. Uh, and what I want to talk about is basically few things that are important to uh, remember, especially from the point of view of actual policies, on how we can reach a rapid innovation-based growth in a globalizing world. So, first of all, the discussion points. Um, what happens if you look in the last 20 or 30 years, there have been happening global changes that actually allow for different, multiple pathways to succeed for places. Um, I also want to emphasize that if we care about innovation-based growth, there are actually new roles for public private policies and we have to realize them. I will briefly try to uh, concentrate those abstract ideas with two international examples, talk very briefly about something that Canada does not have, some American actually almost all of them do have, and that's the innovation policy agencies and what can be the role. And to quickly conclude by thinking about what does it mean that we actually have a choice if we want to develop. So first of all, if we briefly take the world since the late 80s, what we find is that a multiple of countries have succeeded in what we call high tech or basically growing on rapid innovation based by developing a very different set of capabilities. Nothing that happened before. So for example, if you think about the Japanese or Korean, South Korean car industry, we think about the whole car industry. They produced everything when they started to go global from the wheels to the car to the windows. You now think about an industry I really like, which is semiconductors. And you look at few countries that are actually quite successful. The United States, Israel, Taiwan, and Korea, just in this example. You will find out that each one of you have in your hand, pockets, bags, something that was created in one of those countries. But what they do in order for them to succeed in semiconductors even when it is done by the same company, for example, Intel, is very, very different. In Israel and in Silicon Valley, they basically try to put ideas on silicon, come up with new innovation and figuring out how, how to put them on silicon. Taiwan is the best world in the world to then actually figure out how to make them. You look at Korea and you immediately see that they control very specific issues. That tell you what really happened in the world. We moved to a world where production, both goods and services, fragmented. And what you have is not just specialization in specific industries, but in specific stages of those industries. Which means that in order to succeed, you need innovation or capacities, not just for that industry, but to that specific stage. And they're quite different. If you want to think about the rise of the latest superpower, China, and how different it was from Germany, Japan, Korea, you can immediately realize that China started to industrialize when the world has already changed. So it did not need to do what Japan and South Korea did. So that's what we call production. And again, for both goods and services, it's globally fragmented. Another thing that happened, which I will not talk about today, but it's important to remember, is that the same thing happened in the services. Partly because of the algorithm revolution, the fact that we can take services and with ICT, basically routinize them and make them into a product, meaning that productivity actually grows with services. And here I'm not talking about the fact that if Joe was cleaning windows for GM, I can't do it as manufacturing, but if the same Joe now opened Joe Cleaning and cleans the same window for GM, 
we now confident in the National Statistics and Services. I'm talking about the fact that through ICP, we completely change what services are, and we can reproduce them. The third thing that we have to remember is that rapid innovation-based growth actually calls for a different logic of policy. So, again, going back to the example of the cars and Japan. When Japan wanted to enter the car industry, it knew what the car is. Everybody knew what the car is. Everybody knew how you sell cars. Everybody knew who is buying them. You knew the product, you knew the technology, you knew the market, you knew the business model, and you can devise tactics or strategies how to attack. If you're really serious about innovation, you don't know what the product is, you don't know what the market is, you don't really know how the consumer would react, and you don't really know what the business models would work. From the point of view of public policy, basically what you're trying to do is to create agents, actors, individuals, and companies that will do, by definition, things that you don't know what they are, which is completely different than trying to create a communist. And what the role of the states here is to create, basically, I'm a professor in university, that's supposedly my role, is to create new students and research. It's not enough, and that's where Canada is actually not doing very well, after you create all those wonderful students and people and research, you actually need them to stimulate them to commercialize, if you will, or to act in a way that creates companies of growth. And if that fails, in some cases, the states actually step in. So, for example, in Taiwan, any one of you who work in the semiconductor industry probably heard of UMC and TSMC. You have to remember both are direct spin-off from a government institution that were spun off after no private investors were willing to invest. And the government actually had to step in and put most of the money. So, how did countries do that? And what are the things that change the ways in which we succeed? States might actively engage in two critical domains. One is the R&D market failure, specifically because innovation is not just high risk, but also very uncertain. And it is basically information, it's knowledge. Meaning, for example, if I invented the wheel, Every one of you will now use the will for your next set of innovations. So I will not appropriate the whole money or profits from inventing the will. And I also created my own competition. By definition, under free market conditions, we will not have enough innovation for what will be the social optimal. That's why we have things like patent laws. And that's why most government actively engaged in giving R&D grants, tax incentive, public research institutions. The way the state do that impact what kind of capacity they build and how they actually stimulate and act in the industry. The same is local global. So yes, um, Latin America and Canada understand that it's important to uh, be global. But if, for example, you're two young people from Zimbabwe and you just invented something that you think is extremely cool and highly profitable, which also tend to be mission critical for Intel, and you give Intel a call, the chances that anyone would even bother to answer are almost zero. However, if it is part of a government effort, that's something called the same goes when you bring multinationals, either small or big, to work in your country. And how the state engage in those domains shape the creation of capabilities and affect the development path. But we have to remember that each choice path has consequences, both for what you develop or not, but also for the distributional outcomes of your success. So, for example, Israel, which everybody now adores as a great success of innovation-based, 
in the same years it moved from having nothing, and we'll discuss it in a moment, to having the highest number of IPO on NASDAQ after the US, Israel moved from being the second most anti-Ethereum society in the OECD to the second most unequal. Right now, every fifth household in Israel is under the poverty line. And it is directly related to the way Israel devised its economic mirror. So the consequences of the choices that we make are quite important. So four critical domains, skills and resources. The skills is really where, how do you create them and where. So Taiwan created most of the skill in public research institutions. Israel created most of those skills in companies. That's important to the way that then they are employed in creating innovations. Second is resources. Are you trying to focus on specific industries? For example, what Canada is now trying to do, the super clusters, or not? And are you trying to push a lot of resources or not? That again will stimulate your innovation agents in different the second is how you act with the global world. And here it's important to think about foreign firms, both within your country and outside your country, and foreign investors. So two examples. Intel is the most important employers in both Ireland and Israel. In Israel, it started from a small R&D unit to now become, after the, the basic merger with mobile app, Intel, all of Intel autonomous vehicle activities, vehicles activities will happen in Israel, mostly around Jerusalem and Haifa. You look at Ireland, it started from box assembly, move slightly to R&D. You run this for 30 years. On one side in Israel, Intel wants kind of people it employs, the kind of suppliers it interacts with, are all about R&D. And the kind of people that graduate from Intel to start their own companies are people that moved all the way of product development, even working in Silicon Valley. You look at Ireland, the same number of people, but what they did was assembly. The second is with foreign investors. Again, what do you allow foreigners to do within your country? But also, what do you consider a great success? So in Israel, the government of Israel actually viewed as a failure if a local company is listed on the local stock exchange and not the NASDAQ. In Taiwan, the government made it almost impossible, legally speaking, for Taiwanese companies to directly go IP on NASDAQ. And that completely changes the kind of business models and financial models that startups could employ in Taiwan. So Israel, in 1968, when Israel for the very first time actually thought about innovation and did a survey, they didn't even know that it's called innovation, they called it science-based industries. They found out that there's 886 R&D workers with academic education in the whole industrial sectors. So I would say this room and probably two more rooms in Mars, and you have the whole population of R&D people in Israel. And that's not a spelling mistakes. Um, you might be used more for those numbers of inflation in Argentina, but we're speaking about in Israel in 10 years. How many of you know what is the name of the Israeli currency? Is that the full name? New Israeli. New Israeli shekels. Because it began with the lira, basically the pound, moved to the shekel. Within two years, the shekel was completely worthless. But the Israeli bureaucrats are not as innovative as the startupists, so instead of finding a new name, they just said new Israeli shekels. But in less than 10 years, the currency was changed twice, and 10,000 liras worth one new Israeli shekels. Just to put it in perspective. The recovery from those things is Israel have the largest number of high-tech firms from NASDAQ after the US and Canada actually fixed it. 
after US, Canada is no longer in the game. And by 2000, so about 30 years after Israel started to engage, not only IT export became bigger, <coughs> but what is in, in, uh, especially impressive is the 70% of GDP growth came only solely from startups. So from basically nothing, the whole engine of our economy is now startups. How it was done? It was done by science-based industry, and I said high tech. Nobody knew what high tech is. But policy is R&D horizontal. Basically, the government said, we are interested in projects for new products. If you come with projects, we will lower the risk by giving you money. Global local. Basically, the government said, we care, but R&D happens in Israel. We don't care who owns it. And as a matter of fact, we, don't, we are not capital rich. We need the foreign investors. But we also want, if the multinationals come, that they come to do R&D, not us. The outcome, success of the suppliers of new technologies and products. Basically, Israel and Silicon Valley look like twins, and it's the only place in the world that looks like that. The challenge is that the industry migrate to the US. If your investors are American, you want to list on Nasdaq. At some point, you actually look like an American multinational with an R&D subsidiary in Israel. And it's actually an open question whether the Israeli high-tech miracle created more good jobs for the US or Israel. It's all sales, back office, CEOs, all of them are in the U.S., not in Israel. Also, the building of sustainable success. We can all think about a few Israeli technologies that change our life. None, or maybe one of those companies, Checkpoint, for example, and might be the only example, actually are still alive and controlling that niche. The third we already talked about is severe you actually look at the economic inequality of Israel, you look at the economic inequality of Mexico, and it's not clear that there's any difference. And the thought is, what happened after ICP? Think very hard, and you cannot think about a lot of Israel innovation that do not involve ICP. Finland is a completely different example, actually much closer to uh, Canada. Finland was completely reliant on commodities. And not only on commodities, but not even on trade, on barter. It was a pet of the Soviet Union. It gave the Soviet Union big things, and the Soviet Union gave them other things, not even money. With the destruction of the Soviet Union, uh, you had a severe economic crisis. If you look at the figures, they're actually worse than what happened in 2008 in Europe. The recovery, however, is that Nokia has, was the world leader in mobile telephony. And Finland is considered one of the only places in the world where you have innovation in both what we call high-tech and traditional. If you went to a Finnish forest in 2000, you would, you would have discovered that what we now call the Internet of Things is already there, completely there. And that all those innovations including the machineries, is actually finished. The way that they have done is that they basically reconfigurate all the institutions that they had, which is what we call new corporatism, or the welfare state, if you will, to move and focus on innovation. Great success on ICT, build an, a one, one rapidly fading company, success in traditional industry. The problem now is that while Helsinki, if you look, go to Helsinki, the startup scene have created even more jobs than Nokia in Helsinki. It's not clear that it's the same thing. It's not clear that those startups will actually create jobs, the same kind of jobs, good jobs for things that Nokia did. And it's not clear that they'll have overall impact or that will even be stayed there. So, Let's very, very briefly talk about what can be the role of policy. If you remember, we talked about a different logic of policy. You are faced 
with undefined markets and products. And as a matter of fact, the technology itself, if you go to the extreme, is a product. The way you have to think about it from a policy point of view is therefore <coughs> that you need to have a commitment to a process of continuous policy experimentation. Policy experimentation also means that you have to kill things that don't work. Now, I don't know how many of you work in the public sector, but one of the most difficult things to do for public and ministries and the rest is to come up with new policies. Think for a moment about Canada. This new government talked about innovation being the main pillar of what they do. We have yet to have an innovation policy. It's even worse, however, if you need to kill anything. And it's even worse when you have a prime minister saying that innovation is the most important thing. Because it's one thing to say, this is a great policy, let's start it. After nine months, figure out it doesn't work, move the money, do it something else, do something else. That's difficult enough. But if you just had the Justin Trudeau hug you in front of all the national media and says, this is a policy that will move Canada to have inclusive innovation within three years in a prosperous society, it's impossible to say six months later, well, we made a mistake, it actually doesn't work, let's cancel everything and move it to somewhere else. It also means, however, that you need, as a policymaker, to come up with radical ideas and partners, sometimes not existing partners, not just the usual already existing industrial conglomerates. The way most countries deal with that is that they created innovation agencies that are actually slightly removed from the political hub. So they can be um, focusing on identification of ideas and targeting different actors, engaging private and public partnership to implement them and redefine them. The reality check and I'm now working with the Inter-American Development Bank, is that you would look at Latin America. All Latin American countries have innovation agencies. How many of them are successful? The second, can you think of any point in the last 30 years in which a country at the top political level says that innovation is important and actually managed to do anything? And if not, what can be done? Should we move it to the provincial and state level? Uh, or are those even where they're successful just at one time? So let me conclude and say that what is actually important is first to imagine the society that you want to become. Then you can think about innovation policies that leads you there instead of just copying cutting, a copy and cutting things that you thought work elsewhere. You also have to understand your current strengths and weaknesses and where you want to be in the global networks and only then figure those innovation policies. But at least as important, you have to institutionalize and have patience. Money is not the key, it's sustained effort. Think for a moment of what Canada is now just Ontario just announced, and that's artificial intelligence and a new Vector Institute. Today, I get the best student into the Vector Institute. It will take them five years before they can actually do anything useful on commercialization. So, of all of you who want to think about change, I would say concentrate less on large amount and small period of time, much more on how you can institutionalized change and have a longer period. Thank you so much.